part two. You're, this is part two of um, the House Human Services Committee on Wednesday, January 19th. We've just taken a short break and we are continuing our testimony on um, Proposition 5, Right to Personal Re Reproductive Liberty. And we have uh, two people this morning um, to wrap up this morning. And we're going to start with um, Indy uh, Schoenger from, uh, she's the Advocacy Fellow um, at, and they, are, they are the Advocacy Fellow um, at uh, the ACLU. Um, and I apologize for beginning to use the wrong pronoun. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on um, Proposal 5. We fully support the proposal and urge you to pass it so that the voters can make their voices heard on this critical issue. Considering the US Supreme Court's recent refusal to block Texas's ban on abortion, enshrining reproductive liberty in our constitution is urgently important. These are unprecedented times as we are witnessing at both the state and federal levels, the whittling away of reproductive liberties we have held on for decades. In the event that the Supreme Court decides to overturn Roe, we have the responsibility and an opportunity to not only sustain the rights afforded in Roe, but to go a step further in establishing personal reproductive liberty for every Vermonter. The right to decide if, when, and how to have children is critical to an individual's autonomy, equality, and ability to participate in the social, economic, and political life of the state and the nation. I apologize for the noise um, around me. I have a little kitten running around. Um, Reproductive liberty is essential to fulfill the promise of equality and self-determination rooted in our nation and our state's founding documents and principles. Reproductive autonomy means opportunity, the opportunity to obtain an education, to work, to love, to build a family, to make a good life, and ultimately the opportunity to live that life as one desires. The United States Supreme Court has recognized the centrality of this right in numerous decisions. In Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, and Eisenstadt v. Baird in 1972, the court struck down bans on contraception for married and single people, respectively. In Eisenstadt, the court recognized the importance of the right of an individual, married or single, to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion, so fundamentally affecting a person as the decision whether to bear or beget a child. In Roe v. Wade, decided in 1973, uh, built upon these cases, recognizing abortion as a fundamental right, alongside decisions relating to marriage, contraception, education, and family uh, relationships. Uh, even in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, a uh, decision that weakened Roe, the Supreme Court continued to recognize reproductive autonomy as a fundamental right, saying that the ability uh, of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. The right to reproductive liberty and particularly the right to abortion remains for the time being a fundamental right at the national level and should be recognized as such here in Vermont as well. Uh, but this right is under attack at the federal level as well as in other states which have passed over 400 restrictions on abortion since 2010. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh's dissent in the Louisiana abortion clinic case, which could have closely near, excuse me, uh, which could have closed nearly all of the clinics in the state and essentially dismantled Roe, highlights the very real danger. And more recently, the Supreme Court's refusal to consider the constitutionality of SB 8, Texas's new abortion restriction law, has allowed for that law to continue and actively impact people looking to exercise their right to reproductive liberty. Justice Sotomayor opined that the Texas law raises a challenge to federal supremacy and the court's delay in allowing this case to proceed has had catastrophic consequences for women seeking to exercise their constitutional right to abortion in Texas. We must respond to the mounting threat to reproductive liberty by enshrining reproductive autonomy as a constitutional and fundamental right in our state constitution. This proposal is a simple affirmation of our values, values that Vermonters have cherished for generations. In Beecham v. Leahy, the Vermont Supreme Court decision 
overturning a statute forbidding medical providers from providing abortions, uh, the court recognized that the legislature had affirmed the right of a woman to abort. Vermonters continue to value independence and the right to reproductive liberty free from government interference, yet there has been no other Vermont Supreme Court decision on this issue since that case. Uh, the lack of Vermont Supreme Court jurisprudence and legal cloud around these rights at the federal level demonstrate the need for this, in, for this amendment. There should be no question where Vermont stands with regard to its core values and commitment to fundamental rights. For those values and those rights to be protected definitively, they must be enshrined in our state constitution. Uh, and there are just a couple of things I would like to address um, just from listening to previous meetings discussing this proposal. Um, first, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment is a restraint on government action that infringes on reproductive liberty. It will not compel private healthcare providers to provide care that violates their moral or religious beliefs. Also, there are federal statutes that protect healthcare professional conscious rights and prohibit recipients of certain federal funds from discriminating against healthcare providers who choose not to participate in the delivery of abortion-related healthcare services. Uh, and these will still be enforceable and will not be impacted by the passage of this amendment. Uh, for all of these reasons, the ACLU supports Proposal 5. No one knows exactly how far the federal government, government and courts will go in dismantling reproductive rights, but Vermont should give voters the opportunity to stand up to attacks and affirm their commitment to reproductive liberty by enshrining the fundamental right to reproductive autonomy in our constitution. This right deserves the highest level of legal protection and we urge you to pass this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Indy Schoener. Uh, I wanna ask um, if there are questions of the advocacy fellow from the ACLU. Um, Representative um, Rosenquist. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it just seems interesting to me that the bill is being essentially proposed to women in Vermont as necessary to protect rights under Roe versus Wade in case that decision is overturned by the Supreme Court. But Proposal 5 never mentions women, abortion, or Roe versus Wade. And why is that? It seems to me it's being specifically vague, so people really don't know what it's about. Um, uh, Representative Rosenquist, is there a question in there? <clears throat> Yes, I guess the question is, why does the Prop 5 not mention abortion, Roe versus Wade, et cetera? Um, is this something, go ahead, is that something you can answer? Um, I, I believe I can. So Proposal 5 is, is um, meant to go beyond Roe v. Wade and, and the right to abortion. Um, it is encompassing reproductive autonomy. So that's inclusive of abortion, but it is not limited to just that. Um, and so the language of the, of the proposal reflects, reflects that. Thank you. Yeah. And Representative I Rosenquist? Yeah. Yes. It just seems to me that when we <laughs> grant more freedoms to one group of people, inevitably we take other freedoms away from the other group. And that apparently is what happens here in Prop 5. We give women greater autonomy for uh, reproductive autonomy, and we essentially eliminate the value of the unborn, especially those that are at, the, at viability and beyond. I, it just seems ridiculous to me, and I we just have to say that. And, I don't know if you want to respond to that or not. Uh, uh, Representative Rosenquist, um, I'm, again, I'm, I appreciate and I think it's important that you state what your opinion, what your view on this is. Um, I'm not quite clear what the question is. And if it was, if you, if you don't have a question, we'll go to Representative McVaughn. 
you've muted yourself, so I'm not sure what, whether you had a question, whether there was a question in your statement. I'll come back after Topper. Okay. Um, uh, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, one thing that uh, I would like to emphasize is we're not just talking about women here. We're talking about men as well. And uh, I want to make that clear. Sterilization, things like that. We're talking about the entire reproductive uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Representative Rosenquist, before we get back to you, we have a question. Um, I hope from um, Representative Wood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Schoenhardt, can you, uh, I was following along your uh, written testimony that we have on our webpage. Thank you very much. And at the end, you, you added some clarifying points based upon other testimony that you had heard or comments that you had heard. Could you just um, briefly repeat those? Um, just because I want to make sure I understood them. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Yes, of course. Um, so uh, the, the comments um, that I wanted to clarify on is uh, that the reproductive liberty amendment is a restraint on government action um, that infringes on reproductive liberty. So it would not compel private health care providers to provide care that violates their moral or religious beliefs. Um, and then the second point to that is there are federal statutes that protect health care pro professional um, conscious rights and prohibit recipients of certain federal funds from discriminating against healthcare providers um, who choose not to participate in the delivery of abortion related healthcare services. Um, and with this passage, um, those, those statutes would still be enforceable and would not be impacted um, by this amendment. Thank you for that clarification. Um, back to you, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Proposal 5 doesn't specifically protect a women's, woman's right to an abortion. It protects everybody's right to personal reproductive autonomy. Can you explain to me what a biological man's right to personal reproductive autonomy looks like and how the ACLU would defend that right? And what happens if a man's right to personal reproductive autonomy conflicts with a woman's right to personal reproductive autonomy regarding the same unborn child, whose right prevails, and on what legal constitutional basis under Proposal 5. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm uh, following that, that question. Um, I think Representative McFawn uh, provided a good example of where um, a man would potentially be uh, wanting to exercise reproductive autonomy. Um, as for the rest of that, uh, the question, um, each case is, is unique and uh, the facts are decided, um, the case is, is, each case is unique as I was saying, um, and the facts of those cases um, vary. So I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment or like come up with, um, a theoretical um, example of, of where it would, where these um, reproductive liberties would be in conflict. I, I can't come up with that. This well, it would seem like they'd be in conflict if the man wanted to, the child to be born and not be aborted. And the woman said, no, we're going to abort the child. It seemed like a conflict. And how would the ACLU in, uh, sort that out? We believe that um, it is the woman's right to do what they want with their body. Um, I think that that's the stance we would take on that. Uh, the reproductive autonomy of the gestational parent um, would would come first. Um, but who, who says they come first? Because the man wants to carry on, let's say, his name, his his heritage, that sort of thing, and with the the birth of a child. And we're saying woman's uh, right to autonomy, uh, reproductive autonomy out, how should I say it? 
essentially um, eliminates his. Um, Indy Schoen, uh, her, um, I am not a lawyer, but I play one on TV now in this room. Um, but I, I, um, my understanding is when rights are in conflict, we go to court. And that is the um, role of the courts to decide or a judge or however that is. And so what um, um, Representative Rosenquist, um, and so I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, is would I be correct in responding to Representative Rosenquist to say, um, what you are presenting is the is a conflict of rights, and where historically this country has gone when there are conflicts of rights is we go to court, and we have confidence in the court's decisions. Would I be um, correct in that response? Yes, that is the correct response. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Proposition five doesn't mention women at all in it, so uh, I'm still trying to understand why they would uh, trump, trump the situation, but thank you. Uh, Representative McFawn, I see your hands still up. Oh, Chair, can you hear me? I can. Um, my whole screen, uh, I can't turn my picture off. I can't mute myself. I can't use any of the, uh, anything down below about who's participating the chat or anything. So what I'm gonna do, I'm sorry about this, but I'm gonna leave and come back in and see if that'll fix it. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Okay, thank, thank you for you. the presentation. Um, uh, do you have any final comments that, let me, before you do that, let me check in with people around the table if you have any questions. And do you have any final comment that you would like to make? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and, uh, uh, and now um, committee, we are going to hear from uh, Eleanor Spotswood, who is the Solicitor um, General, Vermont Solicitor General. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have to correct the record. The, the current oh. solicitor general is in fact still in office until uh, next week so uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> solicitor general uh, in waiting if you will um, <laughs> thank you madam chair um the uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh speak to you about proposal five on behalf of the attorney general's office um the Attorney General's Office joins uh, the ACLU in urging the committee to pr put Proposal 5 uh, before the voters. Um, and uh, I think my colleagues' uh, comments from the ACLU were, uh, were absolutely uh, correct, so I would co-sign those. Um, I know this is the second time that most of you have seen Proposal 5. Uh, I know that you have heard from me several times on the issue. Um, so uh, I will spare you my full overview of the proposal, um, but just a few comments based on uh, what we've just heard. Um, the committee uh, and my colleague from the ACLU is absolutely correct that Proposal 5 encompasses more than just abortion. Uh, it protects uh, both women and men. Um, the language of Proposal 5 is actually based on a long line of case law uh, protecting the rights to uh, choose or refuse contraception, uh, to choose or refuse sterilization, the right to become pregnant, and the right to choose abortion. Um, the, uh, Madam Chair, uh, you are absolutely also correct that difficult cases uh, where fundamental rights of different parties are pitted against each other are decided by the courts, that is the court's role. Um, at the same time, uh, because Proposal 5 is designed to codify this line of cases that includes Roe versus Wade uh, and um, testimony uh, in the legislature has been very clear about that. Um, 
there's no doubt in my mind uh, that Proposal 5 would, as my colleague said, uh, protect the right to abortion um, over uh, any other claims uh, to force someone to carry a child to term. Um, and again, that's based on uh, the language of, of the proposal, uh, where it comes from. Uh, if there was any doubt in the court's mind, um, I think they would have to go back to where that language came from. Um, and they would look at the cases that it was based on, uh, which include Roe versus Wade. Um, so uh, those, are my, those are my brief comments based on what we've heard. Uh, I'm happy to go into detail about that or uh, any other questions that the committee has um, about any aspect of Proposal 5. Um, before we have questions, um, without asking you to repeat what you did two years ago, we do have some new members. And um, uh, so to um, review some of that, I think would be helpful. Certainly. Um, so, uh, Proposal 5 uh, recognize, recognizes an important fundamental right to reproductive autonomy. Um, it encompasses this whole basket of rights that I've been talking about, um, which is uh, comes from Supreme Court case law over the last century, really. Um, starting with some cases recognizing uh, the right to contraception among married people and then uh, among single people, um, all the way to Roe versus Wade and the cases uh, covering abortion after that. Um, proposition, uh, Proposal 5, uh, as my colleague said, uh, prevents um, action taken by state governments. Uh, the state constitution is fundamentally a constraint on state government and what the the state government can or can't do with respect to individuals and individual rights. Um, so uh, Proposal 5 uh, prevents future state governments from uh, restricting reproductive rights. Um, this includes uh, laws passed by future legislatures. Uh, and it also includes um, you know, information or policies uh, adopted by the executive branch. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Proposal 5 would prevent future state governments from uh, requiring hospital admitting privileges for abortion clinic doctors. We've seen this um, done in other states, um, requiring multiple doctors to approve each abortion. Uh, these are things that restrict uh, rights to abortion um, without any uh, medical purpose. Um, requiring uh, abortions to take place in a hospital uh, rather than a clinic, if it can be safely performed in a clinic, um, that kind of thing. Um, I will also note that uh, certainly since we last spoke, um, abortion rights are even more precarious uh, than they were at the federal level. Um, the US Supreme Court has a case before it right now asking it to overturn Roe versus Wade. It held oral arguments in that case uh, in December. We expect a decision within the next six months. Um, and notably, uh, the state of Mississippi um, is now arguing to straight up overturn Roe versus Wade, uh, which is a change from its strategy since Justice Barrett was appointed to the US Supreme Court. Um, it did not originally come to the court asking to overturn Roe versus Wade, but once Justice Barrett was appointed, it saw its opportunity and that is now the issue squarely on the table um, for the US Supreme Court. So this is happening, it could very well happen. Uh, many court watchers in fact think it will happen uh, before the voters get the chance to weigh in on, on proposal. Um, let's see, other uh, notable uh, points uh, in Proposal 5, um, it adopts something called strict scrutiny. Um, that's this language at the end of the proposal, 
uh, which is uh, justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. Um, this is a, a legal term of art, um, which you may be familiar with, um, also known as strict scrutiny. Uh, it is the highest and most intense form of scrutiny that the US Supreme Court uh, uses to review government action. It is not, um, uh, in fact, it does not mean that no state action will be upheld. Um, the, the court uses uh, strict scrutiny to review uh, when a state is infringing on fundamental rights um, or uh, suspect classes. Um, so if a state tries to uh, take some action based uh, on categorizing people based on race, for instance, uh, the court will use strict scrutiny to review that. Um, and strict scrutiny is the standard that the US Supreme Court used in Roe versus Wade. So this is part of what I mean when I say that Proposal 5 is uh, codifying Roe versus Wade. Um, the court, after Roe versus Wade, drifted away from the standard a little bit, but there was a period of time where strict scrutiny was uh, the standard they used to review abortion restrictions. Um, and so again, we have case law on that um, that we can point to if there are questions about, you know, what would the court do under this standard? Um, as I mentioned, uh, strict scrutiny is not absolute. Um, the government can still infringe on fundamental rights if it justifies its actions properly. Um, it's a high bar, but it's not impassable. Um, so uh, the burden uh, is on the government to show why its action should be upheld um, before the court if there's a, a question of whether uh, a law is permissible under strict scrutiny. Um, and actually, uh, I came across a study uh, that showed that approximately one in three laws challenged under strict scrutiny are actually upheld. Um, so it's not as, it's maybe not as strict as it sounds. Um, it is applied in a wide range of contexts to a wide range of rights. Um, and uh, courts have upheld laws under strict scrutiny um, in many different areas. Um, there is, uh, for example, uh, regulations that were challenged under the First Amendment um, uh, that prohibit uh, sexually explicit um, speech but were upheld uh, under a strict scrutiny standard um, based on a compelling government interest in protecting the physical and psychological well being of minors. Um, and so that's an example of a law that was upheld under strict scrutiny. Um, and there are several other examples, uh, which I'm happy to go into. Um, another example actually is Roe versus Wade itself. Um, so the court applied strict scrutiny. Uh, and ad ended up adopting a trimester framework. It found that the government had an increasing interest um, in regulating abortion uh, the further along um, a pregnancy is. Um, and then uh, I know the committee uh, just heard this, uh, but the final point I'll make is um, to echo uh, my colleague's point that uh, proposal five does not uh, regulate private actors. It regulates the government um, and what the government can or can't do. It does not uh, require private healthcare practitioners to provide any particular service, including abortion. Uh, it does not uh, restrict the state from regulating healthcare providers, um, including as to abortion, if the state can show that compelling interest. Um, and it does not require private individuals to undergo any medical procedures. In fact, it protects their right to choose which medical procedures they undergo. Um, Madam Chair, is that, uh, is that sufficient? It, it, uh, yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the, um, the review um, that's helpful because um, actually, three of the members of this committee were not here two years ago. And so this is um, new 
to them. And this is important enough that I think it, that we all need to have the same information. So thank Absolutely. you. And you, um, we have a question, um, Representative Rosenquist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, relative to, you had talked about, there is some movement to repeal Roe versus Wade before the possible ratification of, of this amendment. Uh, did I understand that correctly? And what would happen then if that did happen? I wasn't quite clear on that. So Roe versus Wade uh, is um, currently being reconsidered by the Supreme Court. Um, and it's being reconsidered in a case uh, that is brought by Mississippi. Mississippi has currently enacted a 15-week uh, abortion ban in that case. Um, and the 15-week abortion ban in Mississippi was overturned um, or uh, enjoined uh, by the Fifth Circuit uh, saying, you know, this is illegal under Roe versus Wade. Um, and now the U.S. Supreme Court is considering uh, whether to strike down Roe versus Wade. So the immediate impact of that case would be that the 15-week abortion ban goes into effect in Mississippi um, because cases only decide the the issue before them. So the issue before the court is the 15-week uh, abortion ban. However, uh, it would simultaneously essentially repeal the protections of Roe versus Wade. It would say, you know, or it could, uh, it is likely to say that Roe versus Wade is no longer good law, um, in which case the issue of abortion protections would be punted back to the individual states. Um, and so I believe there are a number of states, I don't actually know how many that have trigger laws that say, as soon as Roe versus Wade is overturned, we will restrict abortion in all these ways. Um, Vermont doesn't have one of those laws, uh, but Vermont also doesn't have um, a codification of the protections of Roe versus Wade. Um, well, did pass a law or some of you did pass a law um, in the last session that, that did put in place some protections, um, but that was a statute. And as you all know, statutes can be repealed and replaced. Um, and what Proposal 5 would do is uh, codify Roe versus Wade so that those kinds of laws could not be passed um, in Vermont. Does that answer your question, Representative McFawn? Uh, I just have a follow-up, if I could. Oh, Rosenquist, yes, I'm sorry. So now it, it slipped out of my mind, so I guess we'll go to doctor first, okay. Um, if, if it looks like my hand's up, uh, it's not up. Um, I tried to get off. I couldn't get off. So I'm all I can do is talk and listen. I can't use anything else. Thank you for your presentation. That's what we always do is listen to you, Doctor. So, okay. <laughs> I can't. I can't get my face off if I want to read something. <laughs> I remember what my question was, and it was that right now there's probably four or five uh, what you would call, you know, anti-abortion type bills circulating on the wall in our committee, and I I presume that this uh, Proposition Five would make all, I mean, if by some miracle, some of those passed, would Proposition 5 make them null and void? Uh, so essentially, yes. The, the hesitation you're hearing in my voice is that uh, it would require the courts to weigh in and, and tell you that they're null and void. Um, so it would require some, some case to come before the court before there was a definitive ruling about it. Um, but uh, for all intents and purposes, that is that is what we're talking about here. Thank you. I say that also, you know, I, the lawyer in me needs to add this caveat, which is I haven't seen those bills. I'm taking you at your word that they are anti-abortion and that that is something that uh, Proposal 5 is designed to um, stop you from doing. Well, one in particular would grant personhood to a fetus at 24 weeks or 
greater uh, gestation. So uh, that's a little different than some of these that doesn't specifically say anything about abortion, but if the person is a person, I assume they, they, they could not be terminated. To the extent that that statute uh, would interfere with uh, a woman's right to reproductive autonomy um, or a, a pregnant person's right to reproductive autonomy, uh, that portion of the bill um, would not be upheld under Proposal 5. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. I, I, I do have a question now. Um, the term proposal and the term proposition uh, keep going back and forth. Um, I, I would like to ask either one of these lawyers, um, is there a difference in that? Not as far as I'm uh, aware. I have been saying proposal because that's the uh, language that I see in this um, document as passed by the Senate, uh, the proposed amendment to the Constitution. Um, but I have heard it both ways, and I, uh, I am not aware of any difference, legally speaking. Thank you. Are there... Um... Other questions? Could I ask one more question? You absolutely, that's why um, we're this here. One, I, I did ask the other presenter this question, but I'm just curious what uh, your answer would be. And that is, why is it that Proposition 5 does not mention women or abortion? or Roe versus Wade. And yet it, it certainly at the core of all these things. And it seems quite frankly, I'm again, this is my opinion, but it just seems deceptive that maybe you have some answer to that. Uh, my answer is very similar um, to the one that you've already heard. Um, it protects more than just abortion and it protects more than just women. Um, it protects uh, everyone uh, with a right to personal reproductive autonomy. Um, and the language comes from a long line of cases that include Roe versus Wade um, and protect abortion, uh, but also protect the other rights that uh, we've heard of today, uh, which include contraception, uh, to use or refuse contraception, the right to use or refuse sterilization, um, the right to become pregnant, uh, and the right to end a pregnancy. Thank you. Certainly. Um, and perhaps I have a follow-up question. In some of the court cases that you um, allude to, is, is, is the term reproductive um, liberty used? Or re yep. Um, yeah, let me find my notes on that one moment, please. So the reason that I'm just taking a moment is because this language generally has been used in a number of cases. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The, the I... language generally of Proposition 5 has been used in a number of cases. Um, so liberty and autonomy um, has been used by the Supreme Court. Um, uh, autonomy and dignity, I believe, has been used by the Supreme Court, and I'm looking for, um, and this is in the uh, reproductive rights cases, and I'm looking for a specific uh, personal reproductive autonomy. So in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, which was a 1992 case that was a follow-on to row, um, they said, uh, these matters uh, in involving the most intimate and personal choices a person may make in a lifetime, choices central to personal dignity and autonomy are central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. Um, 
That is the uh, footnote that your legislative council included in the draft. Um, so she was looking specifically at Planned Parenthood versus Casey for that language. Um, and then there's further language about how the decision whether to bear a child is central to a woman's dignity and autonomy, her personhood, destiny, and her conception of her place in society. So, I mean, so um, the, the import of that is that lawyers, and I mean, this is language that is not new. It's not foreign. It, it in, in fact, is very, um, it, it is clear to those who work in that field in terms of if you have questions or um, you want that kind of thing. Correct. Uh, it, this language about liberty, dignity, autonomy, um, reproductive autonomy, this, is, this all comes from uh, case law uh, that is row and before and after row. Um, and so uh, it's certainly, those are, those are key words for lawyers, um, but even more so, um, this document that I have up on my screen is also in your legislative record uh, as exactly what the drafter of this amendment was looking at uh, when she put together this language for you. Um, so if there is any doubt from a judge, uh, they can go back through your legislative record and look to where this language came from and pull up those cases. So she cited Casey, she cited Roe versus Wade, she cited Eisenstadt v. Baird. Um, actually, Lawrence v. Texas is in this line of cases. Um, that was a, a, a protective, a case protecting um, uh, rights to same sex partnerships. Um, and so, which is based on the, the same US constitutional provisions uh, that gave rise to uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, and so all of these cases are in there um, and, and in your legislative record and contributing to the language of this amendment. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, committee, do you have any final questions? Um, I don't see any. Ms. Potswood and um, Indy uh, showing her, I want to thank both of you for your testimony, um, your legal testimony and your testimony today in terms of outlining where some of the length, both um, <clears throat> support for, um, but also more importantly, some of the legal um, roots of this and answering some of our questions, which we will continue to have. Um, this will um, end our, our uh, testimony today on um, Proposal 5, and we will pick up testimony on Proposal 5 tomorrow um, and uh, tomorrow, af um, tomorrow after lunch. Our original agenda said we would be starting at 1.15. I would like to start us at 1 um, so that we have sufficient time before we go on the floor um, because Dr. Nasco was not able to uh, come today. He's a doctor <laughs> um, and he had patients uh, to see. And so um, uh, in deference to his schedule, wanted to, to, and to get all those in, we, so we will have um, uh, he, um, as well as um, someone from Vermont Right to Life, as well as someone from, um, uh, it used to be Vermonters for Ethical Healthcare. They're, I think the group now is called Vermonters for Good Government, um, Norm Smith, um, but that will be, uh, and as well, and then someone from the Vermont Medical Society, and I don't, and um, that will uh, wrap up our 
testimony um, before the public hearing, which is next Wednesday. Um, and uh, then after the public hearing on Thursday, we'll talk about, you know, we'll, in between, we'll, as a committee, we'll talk about this, but after the public hearing on Thursday, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what we've heard and what our, um, what our committee's um, ultimate decision um, is. Um, and so with that, uh, we end this morning's um, testimony um, and to this morning's committee meeting and the committee will reconvene on two other bills um, or two other things before us at 1.15. So thank you both. And if we can go um, on break.